You're listening to Boomers Today with your host, Frank Sampson. Well, welcome to Boomers Today. I'm your host, Frank Sampson. Of course, each week we bring you important and useful information on issues facing baby boomers, their parents, and other loved ones. And I just want to uh, really thank everybody for all their support. Our listeners keep growing each and every day. Uh, many of you are going, some of you go to our website, the boomerstodayradio.com. But I have to say the most of you are probably going on your morning walks and listening to it on uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, a lot of different ways to listen to it. So again, thank you for your support and sharing uh, our podcasts with others. Really appreciate it. But I think the the main reason people are tuning in is because we have uh, wonderful guests and uh, we're not going to disappoint you today. All right. We have with us uh, Deb Halsey, who is a past and who is a past and present caregiver, currently caregiver to her mother. Deb lost her job due to caregiving issues as a result, founded and founded her company Advocate for Mom and Dad. She writes on caregiving issues for adult children of aging parents at her website, www.advocateformomanddad.com. Deb is, uh, is the author of Your Caregiving Relationship Contract, a practical step-by-step -step guide for discussing relationship issues that arise between caregivers and their care partners. So Deb, thanks so much for joining us on Boomers today. Really appreciate it. Frank, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I appreciate giving, being given the opportunity to talk to other boomers. I'm, I'm of that generation. Yeah, great, great. Well, we're right, uh, both of us are. So, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm always interested because as uh, I mentioned to you, I've uh, spent some time uh, writing a book as well. And um, I'm always curious to know uh, kind of the catalyst behind uh, someone uh, writing the book. So tell us a little bit uh, about what went into it and tell us a little bit more about the book itself. Sure. I'd love to. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, I, they say everybody has a book in them and, and uh, I do think that's true. And I was being urged by colleagues and peers and friends, Oh, you should write a book, but I really didn't know what it was I wanted to write the book about. And then I had the opportunity to present at a caregiver conference. And as soon as I, realized what the topic was for the caregiver contract, which is basically caregiving changes relationships, um, there was the book. And the book is actually six or seven blog posts that I had written previously knitted together. And these were blog posts that really resonated with my readers. Um, you know, and so when I realized the topic and realized what I wanted to present on, I thought, okay, here's the book. And then in a fit of insanity, I decided I want to have the book to sell at the conference. So I wrote it between April and August one uh, of 2019, pretty much didn't do anything else, but I wrote it and published it, self-published and, um, and talked about it. And it's been going great ever since in terms of sales and in terms of talking to people like you about this concept. Fantastic. And how can uh, people get the book? So it's out on amazon.com. Uh, you can get it in ebook and in paperback. And I'm in the process of working on an audio book. Uh, you can do it by my name. Last name is Halisey, H-A-L-L-I-S-E-Y. Or you can look for your caregiver relationship contract. Great. Great. So, you know, I made, uh, in introducing you, um, it, I said that you, you had lost your job due to caregiving issues. And that seems to be a huge issue today with companies uh, who maybe don't have particular policies internally or benefits relative to caregiving for a family member. I know uh, a lot of companies have policies regarding, you know, issues uh, in childcare, but uh, a little bit different uh, with uh, issues, caregiving issues with uh, uh, adults. 
any thoughts you have on that? Because you you were an example of that, it appears, and that seems to be an issue around around our country. I, I yeah, I think uh, here's the interesting thing about the pandemic: it forced companies to rethink and revisit the way they do business. When you couldn't go into the office, suddenly technology became something that was very viable in a way that they had been reluctant to do before. And what I'm seeing and reading and hearing is that they've discovered that, for example, in Manhattan, it's really expensive to have an office building. And maybe that's not what they want to do. Maybe they don't want real estate or as much real estate. And so I think it's, we're at an interesting inflection point with companies really starting to look at a, how we're doing business and what makes sense. What can we keep the pandemic that we know no worked um, from going in and, and telecommuting on off days, you know, the hybrid model to really figuring, you know, figuring out how they can help people. It also became very clear. It also became very clear that um, that people, the amount of women that left the workforce because they had to be caregivers was, is, is crazy. It's just insane. And so I think from top to bottom, from federally down to local levels, people are looking at how do we change that? And so we're at an inflection point. I think companies are becoming more open to really supporting caregivers. And you see that in some of the legislation that's coming around, both at the state and federal level. You see that in an organization called the Times Up Foundation, which is where major companies are really saying we have got to support essential caregivers, family caregivers, and the professionals as well, you know, who come in your home and help to help, uh, help you. So I, I we're at an interesting inflection point. I think if I had, I think if it was now when my situation, it might have ended differently. But I will say that I'm glad it was happened when it happened because that was the move for me to start my company and to start writing and publish a book and do speaking and do consulting with families. And, and I will say, Frank, I will never go back to corporate. Never. Yeah. Yeah. Love what I'm doing. That's great. That's great. Good, good. I was just curious your thoughts on that. Uh, that that's an interesting perspective. Um, so as it relates to caregiving and, and relationships, uh, t talk to us about that, uh, because it, it must have an effect on your relationships, uh, obviously relationships with your own parents or other loved one, maybe relationships with others as well. Uh, talk to us about, uh, uh, what, what, what effect and what advice you can give to our listeners relative to that. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I think that, uh, I think, well, not I think, I know that too often caregiving is defined by the tasks you have to do. I have to take mom to the doctors. I have to take dad to the bank. Um, you know, mom's not feeling well. I have to do wound care. Whatever those tasks of a caregiver are, which include things that I have to do. You know, I, my mom is legally blind. She's 89, legally blind. We're keeping in her in her, our family home with 24-7 live-in care, except I'm her hands-on caregiver every other weekend, doctor visits, you know, phone calls daily, the whole nine yards. And I think that because we are so task focused and you, we see that as professionals, right? Like as soon as somebody starts talking to you about mom or dad, they start to go down the list of the activities of daily living. Can they bathe? Can they eat? Can they toilet? Can they get out of bed? Can they dress? Right? Those are all tasks as well as the instrumental activities of daily living. What nobody looks at is the emotional component of caregiving. And for me, that's harder. It really, really is. And I think that, you know, caregiving is in a location, it's an experience and the emotions are a big part of that. It's uh, that experience. And what I realized with my mom is that even though I kind of knew it was coming because I was caring for my dad the last year of life and he was her caregiver. 
when it actually happened, wow, I was resentful of having to give up my life. I was angry. You know, all those emotions bubble to the top. And it's way too easy to really ruin a relationship if you don't deal with the emotions and have discussions. But, but the other part of that is the way that you can get beyond the emotions and get to the joy and the love is we have to learn how to set boundaries, mm-hmm. not just with the person we're caring for, but with everybody else in our life. We have to learn how to ask for and say yes to help. And that's hard if our carry doesn't want help. So then what, what can help you? We have to be aware of um, how you have a support network, right? You have for yourself, like who are your, I call them my caregiving peeps. Who are your peeps that you can go to when you just want to go outside and scream, right? You have to let go of some things that you think like, well, my sibling should be helping for whatever reason they can't or they're not going to. So you've got a family of origin and maybe they can help. But you also have a family of choice. These are the people that surround you that can be your support network when and if or in addition or in addition to your family. So without setting boundaries, without asking for help, without having a support network around you, those emotions can swallow you up. I think it's interesting. Mom and I struggled growing up. We really did. And I could see this really impacting our relationship in a negative way. And kind of when I, you know, through the years figured these pieces out, we've actually gotten to the point where mom and I are a team. We're absolutely a team. And, and part of that are really having very intentional, some really hard conversations. And, and I set boundaries with my mom as well. You have to, to keep your health and your sanity. Right. Well, I'm sure it's a fine line and I'm sure it kind of depends also on the amount of care uh, the parents may need. Uh, however, the, I guess my, my question is how, how do you maintain that, uh, uh, let's in your case, the, the mother daughter relationship, uh, you know, and still provide the caregiving instead of, you know, I, I always say to uh, uh, people, let's say if they were daughters, um, that really it's be, really has taken their toll. The amount of care is is great, and I, I say it might be time to, you know, become a daughter again and let someone else do the caregiving. I mean, what what are your thoughts on on that whole thing? And how, so, how do how do you balance how do you balance that? I I agree a hundred percent that when you are the hands-on caregiver, it's very, very difficult because there are so many tasks to get back, to get, to get back to that. So I'm going to answer this kind of in a, in a, in a two part. Um, One of the, you know, uh, one of the things when I talk about in the book, the caregiver relationship contract, I talk about what are you willing or not willing to do for one another, right? And that's where the boundaries start to come in. And then what are the social activities and the events that bind your your relationship together? And that's where our mother-daughter relationship comes back, right? So even though I'm really task-focused on the weekend, I make sure that we do something like play cards because my mother loves to play cards. And in that hour or two, I'm focused on her and not focused on a task, a caregiving cat task. Mom's Italian, right? She, she's, I grew up as her sous chef cooking. Um, she loves to have people over, you know, prior to the pandemic. And we're just getting back to that. On a weekend, I'm with my mom, and if my friends want to see me, I'll say, you know, it's a mom weekend, so I can't meet you, but why don't you come to mom's house and, and have dinner with us? And in that cooking activity together, we go back to that mother-daughter relationship. And she loves it. I love it. And um, by the same token, she gets the social outlet when my friends that she knows comes to visit. But by the same token, I have also had very frank conversations with my mom. And this is where we get into trouble as caregivers. You know, too often we feel 
when they're vulnerable, we will promise something we can't keep. Like I will, I, you'll always be in this house, mom. We'll never have you leave. You don't know what this caregiving journey is going to bring. You just don't. And there may become a point where you can't mentally or physically do that full-time caregiver job because it requires so much additional medical care, right? For my mom, if my mom ever can't use her walker and has to go to a wheelchair full-time, she can't stay in her house. And so early on, I had the conversation about, mom, I will help you stay here as long as you can but you can't stay here if you're in a wheelchair. So you need to be strong. If you're in a wheelchair, we've got to make another decision. So that's one of those hard intentional conversations that we've had that also kind of sets a boundary and asks something of her. But I know at some point I may need the services of your organization to say, help me find a place for mom. She's not going to be happy about it. But we've been, I've been very honest with her and she's been very honest with me. So while the caregiving tasks are maybe don't consume every moment of your day, really, really try and preserve that relationship with those social things and those fun things you used to do, even if you have to modify them a little bit. But know that there comes a point in time you may not be able to keep them at home. So I'm going to beg you, don't. Don't ever make a promise when you're feeling guilty or somebody is feeling vulnerable. You know, the better thing to do is, you know, mom, I don't have the answer. Let's talk about it later. Or we'll talk about it again. Right. Mom, I don't want to promise you something. I, I promise I can't keep. Let's both think about it. Right. No, that's great. Great advice. Great advice. So, uh, Deb, we're going to just take a real quick uh break here and I just want to recognize our sponsor and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about those boundaries and expectations uh, you were referring to before. Um, so I, I, I'm asking everybody out there, are you concerned possibly about an older driver? Beyond Driving with Dignity is a facilitated self-assessment program for older drivers. This program has been designed to serve as a vital tool to facilitate older drivers and their families as they make appropriate decisions regarding the future of one's safe driving career. If the individual is a safe driver, an advisor will provide him or her with strategies on how to remain a safe driver as they progress through the aging process. If driving retirement is the appropriate decision, then the individual and their family are offered possible alternatives, resources, and a specific plan to ensure a smooth and successful transition from the driver's seat to the passenger seat. So to learn more, you can go to beyonddrivingwithdignity.com. I'll say it again, beyonddrivingwithdignity.com, or you could call 877-907-8888. Four one, that's eight seven seven nine zero seven eight eight four one to connect with an advisor in your area. We're back with uh, Deb Hallisey, who is a past and present caregiver, author, and uh, advisor to to families. So uh, Deb, thanks uh, again for joining uh, joining us. Um, you had mentioned before, uh, before our quick break there about setting boundaries. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, in fact, I, I will, I'm going to tell you a, a family story. It's in the book. So in 2014, my dad was diagnosed with congestive heart failure and that November he went in the hospital for two weeks. And I honestly, we didn't know if he was going to make it out. And so I moved back into my parents' house to take care of my mother while my dad was in the hospital. And, you know, anybody who's done this and has a family knows how insane it is. I was in the hospital by seven o'clock to see all the doctors. I'd have, you know, he'd have breakfast. I'd come home. I'd get my mother up, do what she needed to do. I would work. I was back at the hospital by four. So for dinner, staying there till eight. And then he would come home and finish working, have dinner with my mom and finish working. Cause I was still working as a consultant full time. My company left, let me um, work from my mom's house. And 
And here's where the idea of a contract comes in, right? My mom and dad were married for 61 years. And as my mother's caregiver, their contract included a bedtime ritual. So he put her eye drops in. He took her blood to make sure she didn't need something. He brought the toothbrush and toothpaste from the bathroom to the kitchen so she can sit and do that. Um, He went in the bedroom and shut the blinds, turned the bed down, brought her water in and made sure there were lights on. And so I didn't know any better. I continued to do that. You know, this is like midnight and I'm exhausted. And all I know is that one task of bringing the, the, the toothbrush and toothpaste from the bathroom to the kitchen made my head explode every single night. And I don't know why it would make me so angry, but it did. And then what I came to like realize is I can't do this. I cannot keep up the routine my dad did and keep my health and my sanity. And so I had to have a conversation with my mom and I'm like, you know, mom, there's a lot to be done before bedtime. Um, I'm really feeling stressed and anxious. It would help me if the toothbrush and toothpaste were in the kitchen, where do you want to put it? Now, this is what I call an intentional conversation about setting boundaries because you're about to change something in the relationship that has been going on either with you and them forever or, or the way that they're used to doing things. And so I didn't say you need to not, to not have, you need, you must, you should. Those are, those end the conversation right away. I am feeling exhausted and stressed. That's the way to start out. And then saying, and then kind of giving a reason, you know, it's, it's a lot. This routine is a lot. I don't think I can keep it up where, you know, can we bring the toothbrush and toothpaste into the kitchen that, but I didn't end it because if she said, no, you can't bring it into the kitchen. I had nowhere to go. Instead, I drew her into the solution and said, where should we put it? And we negotiated. She was not thrilled about the thought of keeping toothbrush and toothpaste in the kitchen. But we did negotiate that, and she decided on a drawer. And Frank, to this day, it sits there. And she gets it, and I don't have to. And so it was the recognition that I couldn't keep up my dad's contract. It was the recognition that I couldn't use the you should, you must, you don't. It needed to be couched in what I needed and why. And it needed an open-ended question or like one or two suggestions because you have to be able to get from no to yes. And the thing of it is, is my mom's expectation that I can keep up what dad was doing and mine is normal. And then all of a sudden it kind of smacks you in the head. This doesn't work. I have to do something different. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's really important. Something you said that really resonated and I think it's just great advice uh, to people is you never want to point the finger at the, the person that needs the care. Hey, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. Or, uh, you know, you, you want to, like you said, you want to put it on yourself. Um, you know, mom, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a tough time with this. I'm hoping you could help me out here. I mean, you want to put it on yourself. You don't want to point the finger at them because then, uh, then you create defensiveness. Would you agree? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Plus, you know, what early on I read a book book by Dr. David Salee called how to communicate with your senior. And, and he really helped me understand that like after the age of 70, we start to process our legacy, like think about our life. But more importantly, we start to hold on to control tighter than ever before because we've already lost so much, maybe a spouse, our health, our job, whatever. And so the more losses someone has, the more control they try and hide on, or try and hold on to, which as a caregiver can just drive you up a wall, right? And so as you need to give them back control in a way that still keeps them safe, but that they can make a decision, fully understanding that if they, uh, you know, if they make the wrong decision and they have full capacity, you, you, you know, they have the right to, but that's where you set a boundary, right? That's where you say, mom, you know what? 
okay, I, I understand that you want to get on that chair and you want to get that, but I have to tell you that if you fall and hurt yourself, I cannot take off from work. So you're going to have to go into a facility until you're right. better. Right. Right. It's just that understanding. You want to do this? Knock your socks off. But this is where my boundary is. Mm -hmm. Right. What What about? Uh, and you mentioned, and we just have a couple minutes left, but I but I think it's important uh, to to talk about is it. just emotions and controlling your emotions. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. It really is just an emotional roller coaster. And I I think so first of all, okay? First of all, getting beyond anger and hurt and resentment and to joy and hope and 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 fun and all the, you know, juxtapositions of those really requires that you be very self-aware. And that's not easy. Right. And here's what I mean by that. Like I, I was honest in saying my mom and I struggled, right. Growing up. And so my mother can ask me to do something and am I the back of my hair on my neck goes up and all of a sudden I'm eight years old again and I am resentful and I have to stop myself and say, okay, all right. Is this, is this request unreasonable? Yes or no. Is this a request I have to do now? Yes or no. And so in taking that step back, I can say it's not unreasonable. And all this is, is my inner eight-year-old rearing that ugly head, or I don't have to do it right now. I can say, you know what, mom, I'm going to put that on our list of things to do. I do not have time to do it today. I will try and get it to tomorrow, but I promise the next time I come back, I will clean out the garage freezer. Right. Because, you know, my mom has nothing to do but to think all day. Right. Where I'm like, I have work. I have her. I have friends. Right. And and so something that has really high value for her may not for me. So it's OK if I set a boundary and say, I, I can't do it now. It's a no, but no, I can't do it right this very minute, but I will do it later. And that's, you know, that's part of learning that no, but. And the fact that no is a complete sentence is incredibly powerful as a caregiver. Yeah, right, right. Good. Deb, boy, I could, I could talk to you all day long on this subject matter. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hey, get everybody check it out. www.advocateformomanddad.com. Uh, Deb Hallisey, thank you so much for uh, joining us on, uh, on Boomers today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great fun to talk to you, Frank. It was great. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for joining us on Boomers today. Please, please be safe out there. And we'll talk to everybody real soon. You've been listening to Boomers Today with Frank Sampson. To learn more about today's show, visit BoomersTodayRadio.com. And join us next time for another edition of Boomers Today.